I was not an overnight success. For most of my career, I was like Master P selling mixtapes out of my truck. But for me, I became a journalist because I wanted to write about black people. So by the time I go in and pitch the 1619 Project to my editors, I had a track record. I had delivered and I knew they could tell me no, but they probably weren't going to at that point. Welcome to Securing the Bag, the Roots exclusive series on work, entrepreneurship, and the secrets to success. Our guest today is Nicole Hannah-Jones, an investigative reporter for the New York Times, MacArthur recipient, Pulitzer Prize winner, and the creator of 1619, a series on slavery in America. Hello. It's a pleasure to meet you. I, I loved your series. It was probably one of the best things I've ever read in the New York Times, and that's saying a lot. Oh, thank you. Because <laughs> the New York Times is great. We're going to talk about your documentary, which I watched, and it's excellent. I want to find out on my, uh, your series, um, you, you talked a lot about your father in the beginning, and your father grew up segregated Mississippi. One of your relatives said, he was so smart. You, you know, he was poor, um, you didn't have a lot of money, but um, he loved to read. And he said, he, you got your brains because he got his, you know, because of those brains. Can you tell us a little bit about him and, and, and did he influence um, your genius in a way? I mean, I, mean I, I would not refer to myself as a genius, but um, I certainly, my father played a big role. Uh, so yes, my father was born in Greenwood, Mississippi. Mississippi was the most violently apartheid state in America. It lynched more black people than any state in uh, the United States. And my dad's hometown lynched more black people than any county um, in Mississippi. So um, my father was born into a family of sharecroppers. And when he was very young, my grandmother decided her children were not going to pick cotton. And so she moved north to the small town in Iowa. Don't ask me why, of wait, all the wait. places you could have moved to. <laughs> Uh, why they chose Iowa, but um, that's where my, my grandmother settled. And um, yes, my, my family was very poor, but my dad always had uh, ambition. He was an avid reader. My kind of love for history, uh, watching documentaries with my dad, those come from him. And even when I was very young, some of my earliest memories of reading the newspaper every day with my father. He did play um, a big role in the fact that I love to read, the fact that I love history, the fact that I was always very curious about why society was like I was. And I think a big part of that was seeing this man in my father who was incredibly intelligent and yet um, worked in service jobs his whole life and was never really able uh, to live up to the ambitions that he had. And I wanted to know why. And that really led me to want to study uh, structural racism and how society I prevented so many black Americans from living to their full potential. I want to um, ask you about also about your success at the New York Times. I mean, I know a lot of people at the New York Times and people are so smart, but to rise, you know, above um, everyone else, I mean, is a hard thing, especially for a black woman. So I want to know, when you walked into the New York Times and said, I want to write about chattel slavery, how did you go about asking that question and getting it done. And not just in a small way, but in a huge, it became, it beca first of all, it became big in the New York Times, but it became worldwide. How did you knock on the door and say, editor, I wanna do this? I think that's such an, uh, an important question because especially for our communities, we have to demystify success. Yes. So as I tell my students, um, I was not an overnight success. For most of my career, I was like Master P selling mixtapes out of my truck, right? <laughs> I, I was trying to do the work and build up enough credibility through the work to be able to do something really big. So by the time the New York Times hired me, I already had a track record. I had already shown you could win major journalism awards by um, investigating racial inequality, by writing about uh, the black experience. And a lot of reporters don't, black reporters don't want to do the black stories. I feel like freedom means you get to do whatever you want. But for me, I became a journalist because I wanted to write about black people. Yeah. I've never been one of those journalists who say, I want to, I'm a journalist first. No, I'm, I'm black first. <laughs> and being black has always shaped my journalism. But we know if you want to write about race, our, our parents tell us we have to be twice as good for a reason. Absolutely. That often the race beat has not been treated as um, a respected beat, as a beat that uh, you can be in if you really want to ascend in your career. But I was always determined that you could do some of the most powerful 
powerful reporting in America and win awards by focusing on race and racial inequality. So, so you had that. So you, so you didn't come in. Um, you didn't come into the New York Times not having an idea. I believe you probably had an idea, right, from the from early on before you knocked on the editor's door. So you knock on the editor's door, and how do you pitch that story? Yeah. So. In some ways, I have been working towards the 1619 Project for my 20-year oh, right. career, oh, right? right? Again, uh, building up the knowledge, uh, writing pieces that were getting longer and longer and longer as I explored the history of America and finding success. One thing that I think is really critical, and I tell young people this all the time, is you have to do everything you can to make yourself undeniable. Mm -hmm. Now, you might still be denied. Right, right. We get denied all the time. Right. But let it not be for something that you did or did not do to put yourself in a position for success. So prepare. So you're right. So by the time I go in and pitch the 1619 Project to my editors, I had a track record. I had delivered. And I knew they could tell me no, but they probably weren't going to at that point. Um, so the pitch was very simple. I, I came into our weekly ideas meeting and I said, do you know this year is the 400th anniversary of slavery? They did not know that. Do you know that American capitalism was founded on slavery? They did not know that. Right. I said, what about democracy? Well, let's, let's do a project to commemorate this 400-year story. But again, I had already done the things to put me in that position. Wow. So a lot of people assume I faced a lot of pushback at the New York Times, but um, I had worked my way into a position where my editors trusted me. Mm -hmm. I had a great relationship with my editors. And um, when I pitched something, they were going to say yes. You were a recipient of the MacArthur Award, which is a huge award, and it's called the Genius Award. I would love to know, when you got that call, what did um, it feel like, and what did they say, and <laughs> what did you do, and where were you? Just paint us a picture. You're a writer. What happened? So, interestingly, um, I believe I'm the only New York Times reporter to have won the MacArthur. Wow. So, that also helped me when I pitched the 1619 Project, right? Yes. Like, I, yes. I, I, I have to that say... That helped a lot. Those I've never done the work for the accolades, but we know the accolades matter in our profession. Yes, yes. So when I got the call, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a MacArthur Genius Grant until my friend ta Coates won it wow, uh, either yeah. the year or two years before me. It was the first time I ever heard of this thing. And as you know, you can't apply for it. You don't even know you're being considered uh, for it. And then one day, you, your phone rings and they tell you you've won oh uh, this prestigious award. Um, so if I remember, my response was, holy shit. And then <laughs> I it. hear all this laughter in the background and I realized I was on speakerphone oh, at the MacArthur it. offices. So I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, but you just don't, you know, you have no idea you're going to get this call and it is transformative. I, I don't believe in these types of labels. There are all kinds of people who have genius who never get recognized by these big awards or by whoever we think is important. Uh, but it does mean something and it means sure. something uh, for someone who does the work that I do, who looks like I do, who goes to the the world like I do, who come from Waterloo, Iowa, uh, from a family of sharecroppers to, to get this type of acknowledgement. Your documentary, I got to I, I loved it. I absolutely love it. It's six, six, six part, yes. It's so good. And Hulu, Hulu is doing a great job. They really are. Shout out to Honest Collective, yeah. yes. I got to ask you the question everybody's going to ask. How was it to work with Oprah? <laughs> you know, um, Amazing, as you would expect, and I remember the first time I met Oprah when we decided to turn 1619 into TV film. I just hoped that I wasn't going to be disappointed because you, you look up to someone your whole life and they appear a certain way on TV and then Never you meet them and realize exactly, <laughs> you're like, damn. But she was exactly as I imagined, and um, she's so, she was so supportive, and she always... I think the thing I respected most is she always was so conscious of her power, mm -hmm. but not using her power um, in a way that overshadowed, right? Mm -hmm. She always was like, is this what you want? Mm -hmm. is, is this what uh, you think we should be doing? And not wanting to be out front and not needing the attention, but really there as another black woman, but a black woman with so much power in the industry to be in the room to make sure that the documentary was going to be what I envisioned it to be. And so I just, I learned so much about how one uses power when you're in that position from Oprah. It's a great, it's just, it's great. And I, I really hope all the readers of The Root <laughs> and all the viewers of this show will watch it. I think you will learn so much. It's been a pleasure to Thank talk you. to you. Thank you. You as well.